Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation and the Courtney S. Turner Foundation. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Maris Aylward. Welcome to Arts Upload. Today we're here at Arrowhead Stadium. So we can prove that football and art do go together. You'll <laughs> see it sprinkled throughout the next half hour. This week we've got stories about two creative couples and how they blend their skills to make even better music, dance, and design. Plus a local filmmaker who just cannot forget his favorite mall. <laughs> that and more ahead on the Upload. We all know that two heads are better than one, but what if those heads are attached to a couple that happens to be married and making art? <laughs> we'll take a look at two households where that's the way the game is played, starting with John and Christina Monk. Their domain is fashion. Producer videographer John McGrath has been everywhere from sporting KC Park to a runway during KC Fashion Week to tell the tale of this duo behind architecture. We are in the Bower, and this is our space. You know, we use a lot of satin. This is a metallic taffeta. You don't think I talk, but when there's a camera on. Yeah, maybe we should get cameras more often. I know. We're minimalists. We like it to be clean. The seam is completely enclosed. I think fashion gives people a, an outlet to kind of show on the outside who they, they are on the inside. And for us, architecture is a, you know, it's a name that embodies this sort of modern, minimalist feel. We're trying to build clothing that people can wear uh, and, and wear in whatever modern context they find themselves in, so. I mean, ultimately we're developing a commercially viable wearable art. You know, you hear wearable art and you think kind of some outrageous things, but this would be wearable art that someone would want to wear and be seen in and be recognized for it. And that, you know, is what the architecture part is supposed to be. How many of those uh, sheer tops? We've been married almost 17 years, so I think kind of sometimes we can just say a simple idea. Not even there. And either one of us can just go with that. We'll just make sure that that's kind of straight like it is now. Yeah. And probably come up with a, something similar to the other one's idea too. Since we've been married, most of our jobs have been pretty closely tied to each other. I am a college instructor in fashion, so I teach courses in fashion design and in fashion marketing. I still do things at the school monthly. Okay. I'm just not teaching classes this quarter. I work for Sporting Kansas City, which is a major league soccer team. Primarily, I work on uh, everything that does or has to do with our merchandise. So I work on designing the uh, player uniforms uh, all the way down to uh, the scarves that we sell at a game. We're selling as much as uh, you know a typical mall store might do in a month. We're doing in three hours. So um, we want to make sure everything is set right. We've got. Um, everything as efficient as possible. And so before the game, we're just kind of finalizing all those details. Um, Rob Heinemann, he's the CEO. He, he, he had a description for you, what was that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a funny one. Uh, you know, when I met Rob a, a few years ago, uh, one of the things we talked about was, uh, you know, my role with the team. It's working good. Cool. He'll, he'll kid me about it, but he uh, describes me as the, the vice president of cool. And, you know, I, I think it's funny, but at the same time, it is something that I take seriously. So from everything that we do. I'm going to tweet out a photo of this scarf 
you know, I'm there to, to make sure our, our brand's cool and our brand's growing. Your head's growing. <laughs> hand draft patterns. Well, I would say I was going to put a dart in here somewhere. Which means we uh, have an inspiration we come up with so and we kind of look at some styling details, silhouettes we like. Then here's some other inspiration pictures. But then I hand draft patterns from scratch or from something, a, a block or a basic template. And then once we know that the sizing works, I make the patterns. Then I cut it out and sew it in actual fabric. It was fun because it's always fun to gather with a big group of creatives. It's a big group of people and I think it's a community of folks who are, you know, looking for a creative outlet and so it's something that's pretty fun to be a part of. There was a lot of interesting things, there were a lot of interesting things going on. It was just a fun, fun night, fun place to be. The last half hour before they go on will be a little bit stressful. I need that one. What if by chance Very nice. one of them lost weight, one of them gained weight? I mean, who knows exactly in a week's time what might happen? See, I think it might look better with just the top. Or without you, know, the you thought you made the right size belt and it didn't exactly turn out to be the right size, or you know, something something could happen. But we want to look at each one before they go out there and make sure it's exactly what we'd envision before she hits the runway and we have it, you know, photographed. next chapter is putting as much effort into the business as we have into the design. With architecture, John and Christina both work in the same basic field. For our next couple, Jennifer Owen and Brad Cox, the situation is a little different. She's a dancer and choreographer, while he writes music and performs it in various ways. They've also teamed up for a new addition to the household, as Randy Mason discovered. I mean, I liked Brad from the start and liked his music and liked being with him. And it was just kind of a natural progression. A lot of our conversations are about art and projects that we're working on, and it's hard to separate this thing sometimes, but he's also just really fun to hang out with. Yeah, so actually, as soon as the music, uh, as soon as the music ends, it can go into it. Just as soon as it ends, okay. Pretty yeah. much. Even before the Reverend Dwight Frizzell pronounced them husband and wife, Jennifer and Brad had been building the Owen Cox brand for several years. Now in the midst of their eighth season, the duo has become a trio. 
Cecilia's seen a lot more dance rehearsals than I have over the past six months. <laughs> and she's, a, she's a, a very nice addition to the studio. But they definitely... I'm actually surprised at how much we're still able to get done oh, yeah, this is with the baby. I wasn't sure how it would affect our lives, but um, we've actually been able to still produce work and put on our performances. Doted on by cast and crew, Cecilia even made it into the soundtrack of the most recent multimedia piece, A Body of Work. Originally, the idea was to base all of the music around the sounds that dancers' bodies make while they're moving, and also the sounds from one female vocalist, Victoria Botero. Cecilia came along, and she was making so many phenomenally interesting sounds <laughs> that, <laughs> that you can't really make once you reach a certain age. And so I just started recording them, and a lot of those sounds found their ways as samples into the music as well. <laughs> Whether it's looping the cries of infants and sounds of sopranos, or playing alongside cellists and saxophonists, or driving the People's Liberation Big Band, Brad brings an explorer's mentality to creating soundscapes. One of his chief inspirations? the longtime collaboration between John Cage and choreographer Merce Cunningham. Brad has a real good sense for movement and choreography, and I think he has a really good eye, really good understanding of how the two can work together. I work a lot in, in jazz music, so I'm, I'm very open to the idea of, of something that I wasn't expecting to happen happening there, you know, in front of me. <laughs> Having the ability to talk to a composer throughout the process and um, get input and offer your input, it's rare. Um, and it's compelling for dancers um, to be a part of the creation of a new work and to get to perform with live music. A lot of dance performances are not to live music. I think that's unique and, and special. Not every piece is, you know, an emotional roller coaster for sure. And we have uh, certain pieces that are incorporate a lot of humor, and that's um, the quality we really like to bring out. I feel like, in general, dance is very serious, um, especially modern dance. And one choreographer I really admire, Mark Morris, brings out a lot of humor in his choreography as well. Speaking of humor, there's that and more sprinkled throughout the Nutcracker and the Mouse King. What began as a music-only big band show a few years back has become an annual dance extravaganza, an alternative that actually hews closer to E.T.A. Hoffman's holiday tale. The original story is just so weird. It's just, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of dark and thorny and, and, uh, um, and it just goes off on these strange tangents. And so we sort of tried to do the same thing, you know, make our nutcracker embrace the original story a little bit more. I remember the first year we did it, oh my goodness, I lost so much sleep and was very, it was a lot of work to put together in a short amount of time. But it's much more of a established piece for us that we don't have to reinvent. <laughs> As a dancer, Jennifer figures she put in well over 20 years of classic Nutcracker duty. These days, with more and more responsibilities, her time has largely, but not completely, given way to the hats she wears off stage. Hey, dancers. I do find that it's easier and more enjoyable to choreograph when I don't have to be a part of the dance. It can be very difficult to stand back and see what is being created when you're a part of it. I also feel like the choreography can be stronger when I can remove myself from the dance so that it's not about, well, this step really feels good on my body, let's do this. It's like, well, this looks really good on Holly, and boy, Jeff can do this phenomenally, so let's do that. As for that new face in the family photo, you gotta wonder, is Cecilia being groomed for dance, music, or both? She's not rolling over yet, so I don't know how much, you know, as far as the dance moves, but uh, she's definitely interested in, in um, you know, watching dance. And just a few days ago, she started to bang on the piano because Brad will hold her on his lap, and, and she'd usually just put her hands on his hands while he'd play piano and just kind of look. And now she's like, I have my own idea of what to play. <laughs> 
that's that's what it needed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The first phase of the Arrowhead Art Collection was unveiled last fall, but it didn't take long before new arrivals started coming in, mm -hmm. like this collection of photographs mm -hmm. behind us. Now, this isn't the first sports stadium to have art on display. The Dallas Cowboys get that honor. But theirs is largely sculptural. The Arrowhead has paintings, glass, even a pyrograph. A little bit of everything. The emphasis here is on local artists and education. They really hope that school kids will be able to come in and get up close and personal with it all year round. Mm -hmm. Okay, now from one iconic structure to another. Yeah. Earlier this fall, the Metcalf South Mall closed its doors, and that hit filmmaker Dave Keith pretty hard. He remembers the days when a trip to 95th and Metcalf <laughs> meant really big fun, and he knows lots of other people think the same way. He's making his own mockumentary about it, and here's a taste of what he shot so far. Spidey sense is really, really going off. Mary Jane. <laughs> Metcalf South was my favorite mall as a kid. I'd go there every year for back to school shopping with my mom. A lot of memories there. And then when I heard that they were closing down, I was like, I gotta, I gotta tell a story about my favorite mall before it's gone forever. Oh, Metcalf South, you were so good. A warm embrace like a sweater with a hood. On Metcalf South, we honor thee for original pizza and spending sprees. This mall walking move is called the Kicking Goat. And kick, walk, walk, and kick. We make it a little more epic than it really is. The storyline is that it's the last week that the mall is open and the mall has invited back all its former employees and people that love the mall. So most of these characters, their lives have like peaked when they worked and lived and shopped at Metcalf South. So, and their life has kind of gone downhill. I've been lucky to meet like a lot of the best actors in town. And there are people that have Metcalf South stories that they wanted to incorporate into their characters, and then others had other malls that they went to as kids that they're kind of incorporated into their characters. And most of them created their own backstory and look for the film. There's a very, very rough script, uh, and I just, I just let them kind of go with it. Uh, I believe, first of all, that Metcalf South uh, is a spaceship that was sent to us to bring people joy. Uh, I believe that the aliens have abandoned the ship and the magic just isn't here anymore. And you can go to Oak Park Mall and maybe the stores are open and maybe you can get a hot dog, but they will never have the magic that Metcalf South has. It's, it's weird being in there. Uh, now there's nobody in the mall, so. It's, it's kind of eerie, but it's also kind of the best set you could ever have. <laughs> so I got permission from the people that own it now to go in and, and shoot as much as I want. So it's really worked out great. I don't know if they know how weird the movie's gonna be, but I uh, hope they enjoy it. It's gonna be a funny movie. It was a dream. It was a dream come true. And we lived it here at the mall, this mall, our mall, Metcalf's down. Gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I gotta go to work. Yeah, I gotta oh, be yeah. going. Okay, <laughs> bye. Well. Yep. And see you guys. The premiere date for Metcalf Memories has not been set yet, but when it is, I sure hope they get plenty of Topsy's popcorn <laughs> served. Here on Arts Upload, we also sample what's going on in the arts in other cities. Now, I almost hate to mention Denver out here, but it does play a part in this next piece. Evan Anderman is an aerial photographer with a geological background, a Coloradan who captures the western landscape very artistically from high above. Cleared for takeoff on 17 left and eastbound departure approved. Aid X-ray. Cessna 4 Foxtrot Romeo, monitor tower, good day. 
I think I really love flying because of my background in geology and looking at the environment around us. I'm looking for interesting patterns um, and relationships between things, a relationship between different patterns or lines. But I have a you know general idea of what I want to come out and shoot, but I also just look around for something new to see every time just because it's different. You know, each day is different, the lighting conditions are different. I'm looking for that, that the one element that's going to make an interesting picture. And I know generally what I'll find out here and, and how it fits into my sort of overarching theme right now. I had a technical background, I was pursuing that, and it just wasn't fulfilling me. And so after I graduated from college, I came back and worked for a consulting firm, and that wasn't really floating my boat. So I actually went to halftime and started taking a photography class. The current series I'm doing, you, you saw the farmland one, and then the energy's on there too. I can give you a tour of feedlots around Fort Morgan, and that's gonna be the third show in the series. I'm just trying to show people what it looks like. When I look at this picture, I see the brownness of the soil, but then the blackness that's on top of it, that just doesn't look natural to me, which is why I'm drawn to taking pictures of, uh, of feedlots. What do you hope that the average eye sees? That there are a bunch of cows that get to live in a very constrained environment, but then I hope I bring a more aesthetic representation here. So it's an interesting picture to look at just because of the geometry and the composition. I see something that's interesting, then I engage the autopilot, I open the window, and, and then start looking harder at what I wanna take pictures of. It's a unique viewpoint. It's not one that a lot of people will get to see. Really, it's a subtle beauty out here, and I, I'm glad that I've been able to find a way to portray it artistically and beautifully. Well, the airplane can go fast, but it can also go slow, and I like, especially when I slow it down, and open the window up and lean my elbow out like I'm driving along a dirt road and looking down and seeing the farmer's truck going up the road, being curious about what's in the truck or what he might be doing, where he's headed, the sort of daily life that's happening down there. See that train over there also? It's interesting. Every time you fly, you know, there's different light or the conditions are slightly different and you're flying in a slightly different place. And it's just fascinating to me to try and sort of catalog that. I would call those pumpkins in the, the kind of strip. I like to fly around also because the light changes as you can see as you go around in the circle. And then the challenge of what is that essential element that I need to have in my viewfinder to get the, the right picture. It's a little harder in an airplane because when you're on the ground, you can move a little to the left and a little to the right till you get just the right composition. In an airplane, you have to move a little faster or you have to just circle around and try again. You know, I've been flying in Colorado, but also you know, lately I've been going out to Wyoming and Idaho and Kansas and New Mexico just to see what's out there. It's just more exploration. I have had the opportunity to travel throughout the world, and I've been to both polar circles and taken pictures there, and it's great to see all that stuff, but somehow I'm just, I keep being drawn back to Colorado, and especially out to eastern Colorado. A lot of times people think Colorado and immediately they want to photograph the Rocky Mountains or something outside that is very apparent in its subject matter. Okay. How and why did you come to the decision to make aerial photography your medium, but also this particular portion of Colorado. The mountains are beautiful and I love going up there, but I just, I just feel like that's where everybody goes to take pictures. And there are many iconic pictures of the mountains of Colorado. And, and they're beautiful, don't get me wrong. But I've always been drawn to Eastern Colorado, the solitude out there, the barrenness. Also, I'm a slight introvert, so I like to get away from people. I grew up hunting and fishing out on the plains and it always seemed to have a sort of subtle beauty to me. And I wanted to bring that same aesthetic from the nice landscape photos of the mountains to the eastern plains and show them as beautiful part of our environment too. And make people here in the city aware of that. If you drew like a Venn diagram of all the things that I do in my life, you know, technical and aesthetic and creative and mechanical, I think aerial photography really brings everything together. So there's a drilling rig, 
there's another pad that it's going to move to and another one and another one. It's hard to find any place out here that hasn't been influenced in some way by man. The only constant on the earth is that things change. It's a big complex system that we don't fully understand and the question is how much effect that we're having on it. Seven left, eight at x-ray. Well, that's it for another edition of Arts Upload. Kind of cool to have great art right over the concession <laughs> stand. Yeah, and there is more coming all the time. The Arrowhead Art Collection is a long-term project for the franchise. It's one of the reasons we say Kansas City is America's creative crossroads, and we're going to prove it right here on KCPT. Till next week when the Kronos Quartet comes to town. I'm Maris Hale. And I'm Randy Mason. See you then. Go Chiefs. Okay, so try it again. So it wasn't, it was barely on there. That's a little bit better. Now it's coming with you instead of getting caught. Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation and the Courtney S. Turner Foundation.